Okay. So first of all, welcome. It's nice to speak to people, not to empty room. Uh, I was thinking this is actually spiritual friendship and right speech is something that's quite dear to me. It's something that I found even before becoming a monk, I realized that's the place where I want to develop how to speak properly. That's where so many mistakes can and I did not know how to. And then I was starting to find or search for ways how to develop in this way. And I found it difficult and at the same time found some some tools. So I would like to share with you the tools. And as well, after becoming a Buddhist monk, I discovered how much of the Buddha's teaching is actually about harmony in the community of monks, with the lay people as well, for, for the lay people. So I would like to connect it with that as, as, as to have some sutta quotes, some reflections, some offerings. That's sort of my idea I would like to do here. Uh, it will be probably quite a lot. So does everyone knows the Cook Sutta? Cook? Cook? Uh, no, simile of the Cook. It's basically saying the skillful, as the skillful cook would discover what his king okay. likes, then he would serve just that. In the same way, the bhikkhu should pay attention what works for him and practice that. So I will be offering a lot, but it's as the menu and it's for you to figure out what might be nice for you, what might work, try it. Not just necessarily uh, I'm overwhelmed all this stuff. So just, you can choose how, how you think it would be beneficial for you. And yeah, the spiritual friendship, right? We all know it, Ananda, it's not half of the holy life. The spiritual friendship is all of the spiritual friendship. Very nice sutta, I, I like as well is Anguttara 1061, which is just as when it rains and rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, the wa water flows down, fills creeks, gullies, becoming full, they fill the pools, the pools goes to the rivers and then to the oceans. And so in the same way as the ocean in this way becomes full, associating with good friends fulfills the need for hearing good dhamma. Hearing good dhamma fulfills the faith factor. Factor uh, of faith fulfills the careful attention that leads to mindfulness, clear comprehension, restraint, three kinds of good conduct, four establishments of mindfulness, seven factors of environment and enlightenment, true knowledge and liberation. But I like this really, like, like the droplets, because when one is with good people, he hears good, good words, kind words, wise words, and that slowly, slowly as the droplets fulfills all the factors, all the paths. So, as well, yeah, I want to mm, associate with such a people. At the same time, I want to be such a person, right? And I put a subtitle for the talk, the most difficult practice, because I think as well, that's where we have the most of our conditioning and defilements coming and we are with other people and all the pushes and pulls and automatic reactions. So how to do right? In the beginning, I would like to start 
I should with mindful listening, jumping a little bit forward, because that's something we can use right now, right, right now when I'm sharing. And again, nice, nice quote, Anguttara 2, 105 and 126. When Buddha says, because there are these two conditions for arising of wrong view, what to the utterance of another and careless attention. And as well, there are two conditions for arising of right view. And of course, it's the word of another and careful attention. So, you want to have the careful attention, right? And for me, what I discovered, it's not only the careful attention of what I'm hearing, but of my mental states, of mental energies, how I am reacting, how I am relating with what I am hearing. Do I have the careful attention? Do I have the the, the curiosity and openness? So I have some micro practices, some slogans. I find it useful. Some like recollecting suttas is a great tool, but sometimes we don't have the capacity to remember everything. So having micro practice is something I can just try every time I encounter some situation or slogans then remembers for me, reminds me of the qualities I want to practice. So few I would like to share for this session and generally for listening that I find useful for myself. One is listening with the idea he is 100% right. Just cutting out all the doubting and thinking I have my own idea, just the attitude shift of what if he's 100% right just opens and the, the, the space and really helps me learn. Another little bit shifted, some similar is what can I learn now? Which I a lot of times use in the Sutta class, the Vinaya class, but it's something I heard already maybe once, maybe more times. So, what I can learn now, in this sense, does not only mean hearing the Dhamma, but watching my mental state. Okay, when, when the mind goes to boredom or where there are defilements, what I can learn about myself, how I can use this as, as, as a learning how to work with myself, discover the tendencies. And as well, great thing, just let go of all the opinions and how should I respond, how I should, I would say this. We are all smart guys and my mind likes to do it all the time, just thinking how I would do it, how I'm, well, it's nice, but I, won't, I don't learn much from hearing my inner chatter, just being smart. So I'm trying to stop the intellectualizing as well when I'm actually listening. And giving full attention, even cutting out the gaining greedy mind that just is so fearful, so tense. I can even, a lot of these practices I actually practice with body awareness, the, the emotions, the mind can always think so many ideas and so many make excuses for doing anything the body does not. It just feels tense and greedy or pushy or it's relaxed and open. And that's something the mind cannot fake. So I can feel when I trying to get something and the fear of 
forgetting something of what I've heard or what I have thought, and the mind expands and flows. So another nice thing I try to do. And I can try for, for one occasion, I usually pick up one thing to focus on or maybe try to practice it as a micro practice anytime I'm listening in the next week, you know, next month and see what's happened, if it helps me. I will share the, share the slides after, so okay. feel free to make notes, but at the same time don't need to worry about Missing, missing out on something. Yeah, sometimes nice pause and realize how I am now. Maybe slowing a little bit. I feel I am too fast. So now, the good friends, Kalyana Mitta, right? Mm. There is the qualities of good friends from the Buddha. I probably all. Anguttara 736 and 737. And I will preach just the parts that connects with the speech. So he forgives the good friend you your harsh words. He endures what's hard to endure. He tells you his secrets. Yet he preserves your secrets. Something where I feel like just Aditana. Even if I think Aditana means like strong determination. If I, even if I think it's beneficial, I won't go around telling what someone told me that he might be uncomfortable with. I just won't do it. Even if I think that might be beneficial And then he speaker of deep talks and he does not enjoy in one to do what is wrong, which again, something to watch, watch out. Someone, I may actually agree with the person on the topic. For example, I don't know, the, the Thais Korvats or the loopholes in Vinaya they are using somewhere else. But if he starts to talk about it, I would not join him in this criticizing talk. I would try to stop it. Not encouraging in, in slander any bad speech. Is it beneficial? No. Let's move and talk about something beneficial. Not at all. It's something that's Sometimes it's really hard when we feel negative about something and it's really something strong for us and someone would start to talk about it. Just refrain from supporting in the bad, bad habits. So these friends that I feel now weird because I skipped half of the qualities, but what Buddha as well says is that even we if we are dismissed by, by the friend, one desiring a friend should resort to such a person. Then in the conditions for amiability, there is the wish, let the well-behaved friends come and well, let the well-behaved friends who are here stay in comfort and peace. And it's, it's something quite important for me that I don't just tolerate my wish to let someone leave or let someone go just because I'm displeased by him right now. Because the mind then tends to, ah, and to, he, let him perish, right? Let, let him go because now he may be angry. So. I try really not to tolerate these thoughts at all. 
And then in the Acrobat Sutta, Buddha is saying, and how is it because that by protecting oneself, one protects others? By establishing oneself in the four establishments of mindfulness. That's how protecting myself can protect others as well. And how is it that by, by protecting others, one protects oneself? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy. I think this is quite deep sutta and be like for separate talks, so I would just let it sink and maybe you can reflect on it by yourself if you like it. And in the Badali Sutta, Manjima 65, it's very strong for me as well. And then there is the bhikkhu where he might not be so stable or friend. It's not so stable in what he's doing or with the company. So friends, this bhikkhu progresses only by a measure of faith and love. So let him not lose that measure of faith and love as he may if we take action against him by admonishing him repeatedly. As if a ma man has only one eye, so too his friends and companions would guard his eye, thinking let him not lose his one eye. So with the same importance, just being careful about how I relate to others. So then the harmony, right? And, and the caring for others. And now I would be a little bit, I try to separate the general harmony and the speech harmony and then admonishing, receiving admonishing. But generally the, any of the guidelines, any of the practices, reflections, sort of phrases to memorize can be used for all of them. It's just not specific, easy to transform them. So for the speech, there is the stock phrase, of course, abandoning all the unwholesome. But as well, this is not so automatic, like abandoning the divisive speech. Right, we have even the Patimoka rule about not how is it not uh, not basically not saying what I heard here, not saying it there to make one displeased with, with another. The, the big Patimoka rule is quite narrow, but I think the principle is for everything, and it's this abandoning the divisive. Sheet speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he heard in order to divide, nor does he repeat to these what he heard elsewhere. He is promoter of unity. He enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord. He is speaker of words that promotes concord. So, yeah, it's again the Harmony, and what I would say is the idea how the harmony at one is this speech element, the second is how do I work with my inner self, and that's I w where I would say it's not by holding to my views, my preferences, that the we reach harmony it's by letting go of my preferences and my my views that we can I can reach harmony with you or anyone else. And the famous shorter discourse in Gosinga, Majima Nikaya 31, right? I maintain mental act of loving kindness, physical, verbal kinds. Why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what the others wish to do, right? It's such a beautiful thing. It's, and 
again, it's so uplifting for, for the feeling, for my benefit, because I can feel when I am giving up the rules, I'm generously opening to others, then it's just so open, it's just so light, my experience, while when I'm persisting to have it my way because it's the best way, it might be true, might not, but I decide to give priority to the harmony. And I can feel how the tension and all the fear of, of the conflict is getting away and how I can stay really in peace. And yeah, how I can contribute, right? I feel the best way I can contribute is in this way. But the community wants me to contribute in a different way. So I can be generous not by doing the best thing, but, but, but by not making the conflict, right? I have, where I met it first was in Amaravati. I did not even know at the time. Well, the, and the monk asked me to do this thing. And being Western, I wanted to want, to want to know why. So I asked him why. And he said, because I said so. So, so shocking for me. And then I just let go of, okay, let, make him happy. And it was so uplifting to realize I can let go of this aversion that came, right? And, and the next day, again, we were cleaning after the, was it Katina? Katina and a lot of the cushions. And I thought, okay, we can finish today. I can stop, pile them back to the cupboard. I asked the nun where, where they should be put. And she said, no, 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 don't do it. I want to be around when, when you are doing it. I said, what? I'm, I'm not capable of stacking cushions, what she thinks of me. And, the, and the, all, all these judgments and negative feelings. And then, why not? And just, just having fun with it, right? And so, so uplifting and so, and, and no, no big deal, right? Does it matter if it's stopped today or tomorrow, if I'm doing it, feeling the pride of myself can do it or, uh, we do it together. Yeah, that's one of the lessons when I fostered actually in the Thailand where it's really not even asking why. Because even by the asking why, I might have good intention of understanding doing it a better thing, but the person might feel like I'm questioning him. Uh, like not trusting he, he knows what he's asking me. And can really some people discourage to come to me next time? Mm. Yeah, Karaniya Metta. Let them not do the slightest thing. The device would later reveal like a nice one for me. And the ten reflections, one of them. Would my special companions find fault with my conduct? This should be reflected upon again and again. And for me, it, it, it means not only I want to do what's skillful, I want to maintain the harmony. So even if I think it's wholesome, if I think someone would mind, then what's, what's, is, is the benefit good enough to maybe revile someone? make a discomfort for someone. And we will come to admonishment where the approach might be actually, yeah, skillful thing is, might be uncomfortable, but it needs to be done. So it's balancing. Mm, yeah, for me, it's again, connecting to my body, right? Is there any sense of embarrassment and I'm just thinking about doing it, imagining I'm going to do it. Is there some sense of embarrassment, some feeling, let no one see what I'm doing? Then that's, that's where I sense, okay, 
wait a minute, stop, and there is the careful attention what's happening inside of me, not only the objects outside, but how my inner energies, my inner feeling is reacting. And <laughs> but the Ajahn Subaru shared just a few days ago the simile of the cow herd, which I feel is here. And if the mind is untrained, you have to really pay, pay the attention and you just prod and poke as the cow herd would just keep the, the, the cows outside of the outside of the fields of the defilements, just keep it straight. But then when the mindfulness, the attention is established, you just ask the cow hairs when there are no crops, he just needs to know that the cows are there. So when it's established, just make sure once in a while to check with the state. You know, I can cultivate it. I am still checking it's there. Hmm. So some things, again, some reflection I do is, or maybe this is more of mantras. What could be of service right now? How I can be of service? Very nice practice from search inside yourself, just like me, reflecting on that the other person has his feelings, needs, hurts, he is sometimes in pain. It's sort of like, like a poem, one goes reflecting on him and then goes with the nice wishes. May share it later, really then good and, and for me the phrase then using is just like me he might be hurt and that's why he's acting up because he, I know when I am hurt I might act in unskillful ways or be difficult around so he's just like me maybe he is now hurting I don't know what about or what And then when someone is acting in a way that's uncomfortable for me, remembering how uncomfortable these negative states are for me, I have to shift to the compassion. Just feeling now it's uncomfortable for him. I don't want to make it worse for him. How can can I help him so the situation is, is more pleasant for him? It's just, just when people are angry or are, I know for myself when I am angry, it's just so painful. When I am aversive, it's so painful. So when someone is acting in an unpleasant way for me, I can realize, okay, now he feels like I was feeling. And I can feel compassion with him then. A little bit of letting go of my hurt self and feeling for him. I have a, I've seen here one, one micro practice. Actually, my friend was sharing with me. I call it wishing well. It's just, I, Resolve for the next day, next week. Every time I see someone, I just think, what might make him happy now? And I wish him to have that thing fulfilled. It's not that I go and do things. It's just training the mind in the skillful direction. What one ponders about, thinks about, that's where the direction goes. So this is this practice just. Every time I see someone, I try to think of good wish for him and connect to the generosity, to the metta. So it's 
very nice thing. Then some formal practices that one can do like in the evening or like formal practice outside of being with people. One I like a lot is called the double, double, like doubling the thing. It's actually something that is neuroscientist discovered that for the mind and the changes in the mind to happen, it's the same we are, if we are living through a situation or we are just imagining the situation in our mind. So then it's double what it means. In the evening, I remember all the skillful things that I can remember from the day and live through them again or the positive or I do the same with gratitude, just what I can be grateful. And what the scientist says, it's like if I would practice twice as much. <laughs> and it takes just 20 minutes before the sleep. And when I do it with the gratitude, my sleep is a lot better actually. My sight in the morning is a lot better. I discovered just recently that there is causal correlation between me doing or not doing this and how how is my state when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> and one really funny Zen 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 practice that I find more. I did not ever get the guts to do it. It's like this. We carry grudges around, right? Sometimes, maybe less, some sometimes more, and the suggestion is for every grudge, I hold to someone, I take one potato, put it into the sack, and I will carry that sack around with me until I'm able to give up of, of that, of that grudge. Do you have trouble doing that as a month or Storing is not a not an offense. Only storing it with the plan of eating it. <laughs> so I would not. Hopefully, is it correct? One day, no offense. It is anything. Doesn't have to be potatoes again. Well, the nice thing about potatoes is 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 not only the weirdness, but at some time they start to rot. They start to smell as the grudge you hold for a long time. <laughs> so it's like very nice. At least the image for me, just as as if I would be carrying the potatoes around, just stains and slimy and everything. That's it, sounds, it sounds like there's some thought given to it because potatoes last longer than other vegetables, so it gives you a chance to eat it and then. That's yeah, could be. Apparently, this Zen teacher was actually doing it with people in New York, forcing his disciples to really carry the plastic bag with potatoes to work and, you know, so <laughs> it's a very nice image for me. So, and continuing with the speech, mm, one thing interesting, Anguttara 473, he speaks of others, praise in full, and he speaks little in this praise of others. And then the other thing about being skillful, what I speak, what I don't speak, said in Anguttara 8.2 that wisdom is speak a little and speak to the point in the mix of the Sangha, he does not engage in rambling and pointless talk, right? Is the thing that I'm going to say going to help someone? Is in this room someone who would benefit from it? And it might change. I remember when I started to come to the Sutta classes here, like I feel that the new monks or postulants at the time be interested in the stories and the application of the Vinaya. So I would share my stories because I feel there are people benefiting. Now in the Sutta classes, I feel it's not so much important for the people. So I try 
to restrain, not to tell just every funny story I have from my life. So, and other other thing is that I'm actually doing every other day in the Vinaya class. I have some nice point, and then I go, go before speaking. I go forward and realize, okay, it will be it will be spoken about next next sutta sutta class. So I don't have have to lose time of everyone now to just sharing my great knowledge because I know it will be spoken about. And it's freedom for me as well. I don't have to fear judgments from Bhante Arya that he might be annoyed by everyone speaking something and then not moving forward and so I don't, I'm free of, of fear and of doubt. I'm not saying Bantaria is doing it, but my mind may be fearing. So yeah, another sutta. I do not say, Brahmin, that everything seen, heard, sensed, recognized should be spoken about. And here was the measure of the yardstick. If speaking about it, unwholesome qualities will increase and wholesome qualities decrease, decline, I say no speak about it. And this means in me and in the other. Would the other actually, would it uplift him? Would it help him? What I'm, and of course, as Buddha everywhere, is the opposite as well. If the unwholesome would decline, and the wholesome would increase by speaking about the matter, then you should speak about it. It's not just refrain and staying as a sheep, as it's said in other place, it's silent, not speaking at all. It's the skillfulness. And that's exactly what I said in the beginning. It's so difficult. So difficult. What? Endless endless uh, points I can check about. And that's why I really choose some practice to cultivate for a week, for a month, to give a focus for, and trying to at least not speak from unwholesome qualities. Like when I feel I'm not on, in a good place, and speak from uh, when when I am. I have the Brahma Viharas. I have the well wish. I have the compassion behind in my mind. Mm. And mm -hmm. ah, here I have note. I will speak about it later, but impact is not intention, and as well not taking things personally, reflecting on the other. Example, someone does or says something that is hurtful for me. Well, impact is not intention. He has no clue that I am sensitive on this, right? So, no grudges, nothing. Another thing, he might be very sensitive and very fragile person. So, should I go and tell him that this is hurtful for me, and actually knowing that it will hurt him, or I just let go of it, right? Because even now here I know there's a person that is so sensitive, I rather let go than just letting him know that he's hurting me once in a while because it would not be helpful for him. In him, the, not like that he would hate me or that he would shout on me, but I think the doubts and fears and feeling bad and would increase in him. So I, I, I refrain from speaking. 
So here I have a topic of admonishment, <laughs> which is on the other other side. Sometimes it's in the good qualities of the friends, right? The good friend should say what is hard to say, even if it's difficult. In Manjima Nikaya 103 Kinti Sutta, it's while you are training in comfort with mutual appreciation, one bhikkhu might commit and transgression. No bhikkhus, you should not hurry to reprove him, rather a person should examine thus. There are all the positive, okay, it would be easy and he would be happy, so let's go and do it. But as well, there is, I shall be troubled by admonishing him and the person will be hurt by me admonishing him. Yet, I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish in it also. Then I should speak. And as well, I shall be troubled, he will be hurt, and I know I cannot make him, maybe right now, it's the right time as well. I cannot make him emerge. So then one should not underrate equanimity towards such person, not going to aversion or anything. Hmm. And this is something that I would say, well, not necessarily everyone, but we as a quite an often fall short for myself and some other people as well. Just don't want to hurt the other person, it's so uncomfortable. So you just go around well wishing that they might see by themselves and they might realize that the thing that they are doing is unskillful and I just bear with it, being equanimous. And from my own personal history, I know my friends were doing this with me for a long time. And it took me years to get rid of some bad habits because no one actually told me that they are annoyed by it. And I felt I would be so grateful. I would benefit so much if they would tell me before. It might be unpleasant. I might be angry at that point, but I would definitely benefit from it. And that's where the good friend does what is hard to say, hard to do, say what is hard to say. Hmm. Yeah. That means for the people who find it actually hard to admonish someone, to go and tell someone something, for sure there are people who find it very easy to go and tell people <laughs> what they think and what should be done. So they might try to cultivate the other thing. And yeah, so Buddha's advice is, again, we have the five recollections before speaking, right? One should speak at the right time. Does it need to be said now? Does I have enough time for it? Does the other person has enough time for it? And is we are we both in both of a good state of mind? I remember it happened with with Pala. We actually both wanted to speak about something, and then Pala came to me, and I was sort of sensing he's not in good mood. He's angry. I just ask him. Can we just talk about it tomorrow? I did not say, I think you are angry, Das. I skipped that part. I say, well, I'm not sure now. And we talk about it tomorrow. So can it, does it need to be now? Hmm. Again, remembering, it may be too much for him. 
he's already giving his best. So I don't want to overload the person by giving him another thing to think about. And some people are skillful and they just put it into somewhere in the store and does not feel bothered being, by being taught so many things. But some people can get really anxious about having too much on their table. Now speaking of facts, right? Do I speak of facts? So it means the nice things from NVC. I'm not trying to separate judgments and observations and speaking what actually happened, not embellishing, not generali not, no generalization, and separate what I think or feel about it. At the same time, what I discovered in myself and sometimes noticed with others is that sometimes we feel uncomfortable giving admonishment or saying what we would like things to be, so we hide behind general general principle or some good ideas. So I don't say while that was happening, it was uncomfortable for me. Please, can you, whatever. I say, you know, there are the five principles and we should speak of from only from meta, it would be so nice if one, he might not get what I was actually annoyed by. <laughs> and second thing, it's uncomfortable. I, I realized so uncomfortable with some, if someone is doing this, like putting the pressure on me and all the responsibility on me to take care of on him and figure out what he actually needs. So let's just start to recollect for myself. I am doing it. I am here sort of fearful of hearing no or fearful of conflict. So I am hiding and avoiding to speak on the topic. Right? So speaking facts, this is... And yeah, better maybe speak less than more, not giving all the sources. Mm. And one should be one who speaks only profitable words. I was already sort of speaking about one thing again. I noticed my mind is tending to do now speaking not only for admonishment, but real time, real example, maybe skip the details. Someone came to me. He wants to do something. He thinks I'm sort of skillfully in and he asked me Bante how I do this and I start to take you take these tools and and prepare it like this and these are the steps and then my perfectionist and fearful mind start to be feeling what if it fails he would blame me it's not thought it's it's more about a feeling that ends up with me giving him all the drawbacks and all the, the things where it could fail. And he just gets his act together to, to go and try it. And that's definitely not profitable for him if I tell him all the, all the things that may fail. fail. He, Again, it's, it's the reflection, it's the mindfulness, it's the clear comprehension, it's the wise reflection, and then the samadhi of just restraining myself, making sure that I'm not the one to blame by putting all the responsibility to him, by giving him all the things that actually in the end makes him not to do it because he would be just so fearful. So. Profitable. That, that's another thing that profitability means for me. Mm. And one should speak with a kindly heart. That's quite obvious. Probably no need to mm, speak too much about it. 
And one one practice that I feel like mentioning is, is there some something positive I can share? This is something I can appreciate. They said that actually the ratio for one to feel neutral about my speech is five times nice speech and one time negative speech. If the ratio is worse, that even if I speak four times nice and two times I'm going to admonish him, he would still feel I am stern with him. <laughs> I'm sure I fall short with this standard. So I try to recollect, is this something positive I can share about this thing? Something I can appreciate and give him praise for? Mm. And being open, well, being open in two ways. One is to giving the benefit of doubt, which is quite nicely in the Vina actually as well. My perception can be totally wrong about what happened. Again, his intention might be totally different from the impact I am seeing. So then, knowing this, I try to ask questions first. What actually happened for him? And I don't know. What he was actually trying to do in a nice way. So maybe actually, I just it's just misperception. I have one funny story here. A few days ago, in Pantheria, area, we were talking about, at the same day, we were talking about two things. We were talking about the sort of waterfall and white pipe next to the walking path. And we were talking about the new path along, along the lines where I felt very grateful for Bante for, for the waterfall. And I did not felt hurt like being Bante hearing what I was sharing with him about the walks. And then Bante came to me a few days after and so what, what do you think about, about that? And I felt the anger arose in me because he just pointed to the direction. And it's from that point of view, both things were in the same direction. And I, ha I have the impression he's he's talking about the thing I felt uncomfortable with. And then I felt all this emotion and I... <sighs> how, how do I maintain right speech so I was able to at least maintain noble silence? And then we separated and five minutes after that I realized Bante was actually thinking about the waterfall that I am grateful for. <laughs> so I came and, and just shared my appreciation for the waterfall. But totally mis misperceived what Bante was thinking and talking about. <laughs> so making sure I actually understand each other. Mm, yeah, ways to prepare for it, I really felt very supported with the NVC way, reflecting on my needs, on my feelings, reflecting on needs and feelings of the other before coming to him, and thinking in the sense of needs and strategies that usually I think of strategy, how to accomplish something, but it actually might not be my need. Like, for example, my need would be for feeling harmony and I have problem with the person. So I would go to him with a suggestion not to speak each, with each other. But actually, that's a strategy. My need is harmony and maybe for harmony better strategy would be to speak, spend, spend more time together to get to. And what is NVC saying, and what's really true for me, is that the needs might differ between me and the other person. 
but usually there is some strategy that can accommodate all the needs. So then it's the thing of not clinging to my strategy. And if I am able to separate the need from the strategy, I'm more open. Mm. Yeah, here I have again the note of how to do to prevent this misunderstanding. I am speaking about something and he perceives differently is to speak in full sentences, not skipping subject, not skipping object, use uh, verbs. In that example, it would be not what do you think about that, but what do you think about the waterfall for? And it's especially this just when there is the feeling in me of anger, resentment, or fear, and my mind would interpret everything in the negative way. It, it's the same in the other way. If I feel positive, my mind would interpret everything in a positive way. So the other person would be doing the same anytime he's listening to me. And misunderstand me because he will just fill the gaps so I try to leave as little gaps for the misunderstanding by speaking with the subjects with the objects with the verbs giving appropriate context not missing out the context that's something that as well it's very easy to misfill to something different actually mm. And then maybe making sure that he understands or when I am listening, actually I can rephrase, ask him if I understand him correctly before going to my perceptions and ideas. And one other reflection, what would it feel not to say this? I just pose the question in my mind. What would it feel if I just refrain of speaking this? And a lot of time, there is a defilement. There is just the, the ego, the pushiness. And it feels very uncomfortable. Well, or to some degree uncomfortable. If I imagine I would not say it. And then I would say, okay, there is a defilement. I want to be careful and what I am, I am a recluse, I am a monk, what's my job is to refrain from defilement. So what's my priority? To work with my defilement. And this reflection helps me, it's, it's just my tools, right? Helps me to refrain from speaking and I'm not completely sure. I can sense there is something wrong. There is something wrong. There is the tendency, ah, let's let it go. Uh, say it anyway. So these reflections help me to connect to my felt sense and then refrain from the unskillful. No, it's not successful every time. Uh, it helps, it helps. Uh, search inside yourself has nice, uh, how do they acronym for this as well? Siberian North Rail Railroad. It's very weird, so it's nice, easy to remember. Stop, breathe, notice what's happening, reflect what is needed. And then, then maybe you respond if you feel it's, you can respond, uh, in a wholesome way. So, Siberian North Railroad. So weird. <laughs> um, okay, receiving admonishment. The friend I want to be 
and yours was hard to endure and as well Angutra 263 when receiving admonishment here it occurs to the bhikkhu if a monk corrects me he may do so sympathetically mostly especially here I feel he don't go around telling people what we feel to from anger or whatever usually do it wishing well so he might do so sympathetically so I would then say good to him and would not trouble him he's already doing something that's difficult for him so I want to feel him good about it and not make it difficult and actually there is in Vinaya this, this rule one should not not give opportunity for admonishment it's actually an offense of wrongdoing to refuse admonishment without reason yeah yeah, yeah. Mm, I'm not speaking about uh, the 12th uh, Sangha says that there is in Kandakas about admonishment second thing but definitely that's making even difficult one to admonish that's even stronger thing and again my funny old stories about my my stupidity when I was in Thailand I actually did this from and the mind was feeling so so okay the clash of culture right me just coming from west and so when something is spoken about I start with the reason and why and cannot we do it otherwise it was about eating and I, me being a cook and nutritional specialist and sp spending so much time about how was healthy and was not and when someone came and suggested to me, you know, here we do this thing about eating. Then, of course, I started to discuss with him <laughs> about my ideas, right? And apparently, it made that monk so uncomfortable, he started to avoid giving me any, any guidance. So, how I can help him? And appreciate his good effort and being here and now sort of in the senior monk position I see it from the other side as well when someone is pushy when I am overcoming my my laziness and telling him something I don't feel the next time like there is so much aversion in me when I have the thought he's doing something he might benefit of knowing that it's not proper or that he can do it in a better way. I have the well wish, but then remembering in the past how uncomfortable, big or small, right? It was to admonish him, admonish him. It takes so much effort so much easier for me just to give up on him <laughs> and then is I have funny quote for this as well Angutaranikaya 4 111 is the horse trainer coming to the Tathagata and asking so a lot of question and then so what would you do with a disciple who does not heed you who does not train does I kill him? And the horse trainer says, "What? I thought you restrained from harming. But how can I understand this?" And Buddha is saying, "For this case, is killing in the noble one's disciples. The Tathagata thinks one should not be spoken to and instructed, and one's wise fellow monks too thinks one should not be spoken and instructed." is actually something that helps me to overcome my reluctance to say anything to anyone because 
I don't want to kill people <laughs> to just give up on them. And it's actually not wholesome. I can feel it's not wholesome for me either. This aversive state of I don't not caring, just let him whatever. And as the conditions for any ability, let him perish. Just I, I, I let him fry in the oil and then he might leave and whatever. So that's killing in the noble one's disciples. That's something. Sorry? Noble one's discipline. Ah, yeah. No, noble one's discipline. So I don't want to do it, do this. And I don't want others to do this with me. So how can I, I help him? Hmm. Last note. Be compassionate to oneself. <laughs> the same I'm saying for others. I can do for myself. I can be so stern and so critical of myself and giving so big expectancy to be perfect, to move forward in light speed. So the same way I would approach others and would like others to approach me, I can have the compassion for me and I'm training, I can fail, breathing in, I do my best, breathing out, I let go of the rest. Mantra, I find really useful. And connecting with the deep inhalation, yes, I do my best. And the relaxation of the deep out breath, I let go the rest. I can do this when I am overwhelmed by emotions while interacting with others. Do it alone when I fin find something difficult for myself. Mm. Note about electronic means or any communication that is not in person. Just reflecting the persons, or when I am sending something, or me when I am receiving, is missing nonverbal communication. It makes a lot. So he's missing it. So I need to put it into the mail. And I see how my mind is just bothered and lazy and not writing to write along sentences, long mails. But it's a lot missing verbal. You know, Non-verbal com communication, the, all the clues of smiles and gesticulation. He probably missed a lot of context because we have half of the context in our head. It's actually not in the mail. So I try to put the context as well. Or if I'm receiving and I'm not sure, I ask for the context. Or I ask if I understand correctly. And it's not instantly possible for correction. When I'm speaking with someone and he starts to wrinkle his, his eyebrows or I, I can sense something is happening. So maybe there is an understanding. I can correct it instantly with hopefully little hurt. And then I send an email and it may take a few days to clear the misunderstanding I would make. And the person can be already so sure how big idiot I am and how I am aversive about this idea because I just did not forgot to put the content context. I did not put the object there and he just connected it with something else because he was just thinking about something else because he's somewhere totally right. It's so normal. And then, so again, feeling the context, feeling the emotions, which means it makes me quite comfortable about using emojis. For me, it's not anymore the childish thing of making colorful and funny emails. It's something to indicate the other 
person how I feel about. Is it joke? Is it irony? Is it meant seriously? Maybe making it a little bit lighter. It doesn't have to be all yellow, the, the email, right? And then when I'm responding, again using the looping, like, again, or some people call it mirroring in the reply. I don't just reply, I rephrase or repeat part of the expression to make sure that I understand it correctly and then he knows what I am replying to. That it, again, hopefully comes together correctly, not misconnecting with something else. giving the trust that the intention of the pers other person and his uh, is, is wholesome. I remember already when working in our company, you are doing review for one another for the code. And the intention, the need for everyone is to have the best code, to have working product that we can be proud of. And then he will write me that the way I'm doing it is not, not good. So I can focus, that's the skillful attention, focus on he is reproving me, or I can focus my mind, shift on the skillful thinking. He's trying to help me. He is doing something to... His intention is the same as me. His intention is to have good code. And to help me. He's not doing it because he wants to make me feel bad. So impact is not intention. And for everything, I feel it goes down having the sati, having the samadhi, having the panya in English how I can maintain the mind, mindfulness when I'm with other people, how can I have the stability of mind to stick to my good resolve, how I can reflect wisely. So it would have the good results. And what helps me in this is sort of three kinds of approaches. One, as I said, is uh, micro practices. Having some small thing I would like to train in for specific specific occasion, like this week, I would try to speak only to make people happy before speaking something. Would this right now in this moment make that person happy? Will, will it brighten his mind, his day? It's not something general. It's it's a practice I undertake for a week for a, to restrain for, from wrong speech. This is what I call micro practice or the wishing well. Every time I see someone, I try to think of well wishing. And second type of practices is this uh, recollections or mantras, something that helps me to stick to my good intention when when it's happening, when I am in the interaction, when it's difficult. And then that's something really I can relate for I would say 10 years of trying to figure out how I get better or why it is working, when it is working, when it is not working. Is the five minutes? And that's the formal practices. If I just try to do it in the heat, then it's it's lacking the the fuel, the, the fluency, it does not 
have much of stability and the stability for me is best trained in formal practices by by that I mean NVC which I find very helpful I mean inside out I just get together set aside separate time can be alone for this thing of NBC, yeah, nonviolent communication and inside dialogue. I would try to elaborate a little bit, just a little bit. After is to set aside a time when and for the interrelational practices for the spiritual right, friend, friendship, harmony, and and right speech. I find it useful to do it with people as a group practice set aside for formal practice here we will train we will just as going to gym and working out our muscles just work out our muscles of having the mindfulness in the how maintain it while being with other people Training in the skillful means, and I've discovered it makes all the difference. It was when I started to do inside dialogue. I realized after a few months, hey, my mindfulness in general life is like a few hundred percent more, five times more, and I did not see the direct connection. But it was so clear to me. So, three kinds. What I can do in the heat, how I can try in the mind to incline to the wholesome that does not feel overwhelming and I can practice all my life. And formal practices helps me. And in the end, I just want to share Dhammapada 227 228. Since ancient time, it has been the case that those who speak too much are criticized, as those who speak too little, and those who don't speak at all. Everyone in this world is criticized. There never was, nor will there be, nor there is now, anyone who is only blamed or only praised. So, for ourselves, the impact is not intention. We are trying and people will criticize us. <laughs> for sure. So, thank you. And now, I invite you to the right speech as well. Discussion, reflections, what you find helpful or Maybe something was not clear. There are a few points that came up in the discussion after talk. I would like to offer some clarification. Support one is I mentioned that when we admonish someone or plan to give someone uh, feedback about something that was unpleasant for us, it's helpful to think about what we actually appreciate, what was done well, um, what we can praise the person for. And it's not meant like some tool to coerce the person to cooperate. It's more about switching my own inner, inner mind, my heart, from the critical to positive, to appreciation and so not using it as a tool I want to make him cooperate people have this bullshit detector they, they will know if it's coming from our heart that we actually appreciate something or if we just want to make them make them cooperate it's not helpful and at the same time on this 
on this admonishing uh, and switching do this I help find it helpful to do this in long term as well it's one big mistake to give admonishment every time the person fails in something I remember my mother tends to do that that she would say me please do that and I would try I would really try to get better of course I would not do it every time so then I would feel already sort of proud I was unable to do it 50% of times but then if she come to give me you are doing it again can you please stop doing this every time I felt forgot I was so disheartening I realized sometimes afterwards that I tend to do that as well and uh, it's not helping it's, it's really even a person who wish to change wish to train when we start to tell him every time he comes short you just lose all the heart so for this I find it really helpful to prevent myself from doing it and as well for it's, it's a lot more pleasant for me actually then is to give the admonishment say this is what is not skillful that can be done better and then switch my mind to look for when he actually succeeds in doing it and enjoying rejoicing the quality of mudita right of his success and then i can actually even if, if it's uh, if i feel it's helpful and he will receive it and as a support i can share my enjoyment and appreciation with him it's something to be careful that some people might then feel being watched and charged and not being helpful but at least for me it's a lot more pleasant and helps me in skillfulness when I switch to the appreciation looking for the good so just to mention it's not a tool to coerce the other one it's more to help me to be more skillful and actually more pleasant to be with myself as well another thing that sort of might come as a misunderstanding we do our best and we let go of the rest it means that we don't put too much expectation and we don't cling to results but it does not mean that we don't take responsibility we don't try to learn what was working and what not so it's good thing after in good positive skillful way reflect was this working can I do it again the next time try it or should I do something different and with different people different situations not, but it's not I'm 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 speaking from meta I'm doing things from meta so that's my job and I don't care about the results that's that's not my job that's that's not it you can still try to improve and care what is impact of our action it's just having the skillful positive positive mind and then for some people who tends to be over critical for themselves or too attached to results this mantra this slogan uh, may have helps to release the tension the negativity of mind and it is a bonus i felt i would share the just like me meditation in full it's a very nice practice i quite like it 
I do it sometimes as a formal metta meditation or as a start for metta meditation. Then only the slogan in the heat in, in difficult situation helps me, helps me to connect to the strength, to the quality I cultivate in the formal meditation or before difficult situation. I just go recollect through the through the meditation to set a mood of my mind for more compassionate or more connecting understanding. So we recollect that this person I will be interacting with or that's here sitting with me as a body and mind just like me. He or she has feelings, emotions and thoughts just like me. This person has at some point or is right now sad, maybe disappointed, angry, hurt, maybe there is confusion in his mind, just like me, just as I am sometimes. This person has in his life experienced some physical pain, some emotional pain, suffering just as me. And this person wishes to be free from pain and suffering, just as me. This person wishes to be healthy, to be loved, and to have fulfilling relationships, just like me. This person wishes to be happy, just like me. So that's, that's the practice, you can repeat it a few times, just one time, connect to our heart and soften a little bit the harshness that might be there. So that's something I wanted to offer you as well. And I wish you to be happy, to be free from suffering, to be this, have the strength and resources to fulfill your wishes. May you be well, may you be free from suffering.